Welcome to the Starco Planetarium. My name is Eric Johnson. I am the director of the planetarium. I am always pleased to uh, attend as many of these Kaler Science lectures as possible. I am uh, going to be introducing our speaker in a moment. Uh, I just want to let you know that on the first Friday of the month, we always host lectures across the world of science. Our very first lecturer was Jim Kaler, a professor of astronomy over at the University of Illinois. Um, after he had stopped uh, doing those lectures for us, we decided to name this series in his honor. Um, anyways, our speaker this evening is Dr. Chelsea Lloyd. She is a professor of microbiology. Yes. <laughs> Pause for applause. <laughs> All right. She's a professor of microbiology here at Parkland College. Um, she got her undergraduate degree at a uh, small institution that I also attended, the University of Iowa, where she got her uh, bachelor's in microbiology. Uh, then she went off to uh, Urbana-Champaign at the University of Illinois to uh, get a PhD in the same field. Uh, she studied a lot of cool stuff with E. coli. I believe it was like regulatory mechanisms. Okay, And then she decided to grace us at Parkland with her presence ever since. Uh, she is currently, in addition to uh, working as a professor, she is the advisor of the Science Club and she does lots of great work with the science scholars to get those students to transition from the community college environment to the university environment. Um, I'm going to walk back over to the console to get her uh, slides back up on the screen, but I'm so glad that you're all here to see Syphilis, the apple of my STI. It's just a delightfully punny title, and that will tell you exactly the tone of this talk. It's going to be fantastic. Please remember, folks, that if you've got questions, feel free to raise your hand. I will try to get the microphone over to you so you can ask it through that way. All right? That way, all everything you ask uh, will go onto the recording. Um, we hope that you'll be able to watch this lecture afterwards on Parkland College television um, and also on the on the YouTube channel as well is that correct Chris he nods and gives me the thumbs up fantastic well without any further ado go ahead dr. Lloyd I'm very glad that you're all here for Lloyd and not Pink Floyd I hope there was no mistaking you do realize we're talking about syphilis we're in the right spot okay cool so um, I <laughs> Um, excellent. Oh, perfect. I actually chose this image intentionally because I thought it was the most heart-like. You can use your imagination. So I, I really had a hard time deciding which microbe I was going to talk about today because it's what I would imagine is trying to choose your favorite child. I don't have children, I have a cat. But um, I decided it's February, you know, it's Valentine's Day is coming up. What better way to celebrate than to discuss sexually transmitted infections? So that's what we're going to do. And I tried to pick my favorite. And again, that's hard to do. Um, but I chose this one for a number of reasons. I think it's a really interesting organism. It's a really interesting disease. And I think it's a great way to understand a lot of things about science. So, so that's why I chose it. So I wanted to start with a poem. This is a poem uh, from the 1920s, and I think it really encapsulates um, everything about syphilis and what a horrific disease it is. So there once was a young man from Back Bay who thought syphilis just went away. He believed that a shanker was only a canker that healed in a week and a day. But now he has acne vulgaris, or whatever they call it in Paris. On his skin it has spread from his feet to his head, and his friends want to know where his hair is. There's more to this terrible plight. His pupils won't close in the light. His heart is cavorting, his wife is aborting, and he squints through his gun barrel sight. Arthralgia cuts into his slumber. His aorta is in need of a plumber. But now he has tabies and saber-shinned babies. Ball of gummas, he has quite a number. He's been treated in every known way, but his spirochetes grow day by day. He's developed paresis. He has long talks with Jesus and thinks he's the queen of the May. So if you're familiar with some of the tropes of syphilis, there's um, a lot going on in there. And I'll talk about what some of these um, descriptions relate to in terms of disease. So first, let's just get this out of the way. We're talking about sexually transmitted infections. Um, but there are a lot of different historical names for these things. So I just kind of wanted to gauge um, what sexually transmitted infections were called when you first learned about them. So if you 
called them social diseases. Could you just put your index finger up? Okay, what about venereal diseases, number two? Okay, what about sexually transmitted diseases, three, that's me. Okay, what about sexually transmitted infections? Okay, okay, yeah, I'm in the three camp. So that's what they were called when I was growing up. I wanted to talk a little bit about these names. So social disease is kind of self-explanatory. You know, these have been historically stigmatized diseases along with some others. Venereal disease is interesting. Um, it's named for Venus, which is the um, goddess of desire, sex, and love. And this is really kind of a heavy name for this type of disease because it implies um, womanhood. And this is actually a picture um, from a World War II era poster warning um, GIs about venereal disease because during World War II there was actually a really big problem with venereal disease um, among our troops. And so they had a huge campaign to try to curb this and this is one of those posters. Um, it says, don't pick up trouble, avoid venereal disease. And there's a rose with thorns and a face of a woman. And so venereal disease really does kind of place blame with women um, as the um, originators of these diseases and where they're spread. Um, so that name kind of comes with a lot of weight. So it was changed to sexually transmitted disease, which is really straight to the point. But disease isn't really a great description of this either. So does anybody know why we now call them STIs, sexually transmitted infections? Does anyone want to shout it? Oh, I see a hand. Diseases have symptoms, yes. And that's really, really important to understand about a lot of these diseases or infections. So we now call them sexually transmitted infections because you can have an infection and not have signs or symptoms of disease. And I think with COVID, we're a little bit more familiar with that concept being asymptomatic yet still able to transmit that disease. And the same is true for syphilis. So STI is really a better descriptor of these types of illnesses. And that's important because it really illustrates why testing and screening for these diseases is so critical. Um, I also wanted to mention it's not just a sexually transmitted disease. This can also be transmitted vertically from a pregnant mother to the fetus, and that can result in congenital syphilis, which we'll talk about. So who is the culprit? Who's responsible for this? This is a bacterium. Um, it's named Treponema pallidum, subspecies pallidum, which seems a little redundant. We're gonna call it Treponema pallidum for short. It is a bacterium, it's not a virus. Um, and the name treponema means turning thread, and pallidum means pale. And if you look at this micrograph, you can really see the shape really does illustrate kind of a turning thread. And we call this corkscrew shape a spirochete. It's a spiral organism. They're very tiny organisms. So this shows a scale bar of 10 micrometers, 10 microns. That's usually about the length of this organism. The width is about 200 nanometers. They're very small. But they have this really cool morphology. And you can imagine if it's corkscrew shaped or drill shaped, that's how it moves. And so a lot of bacteria have the ability to move. We call that motility using something called a flagellum or flagella that comes from the word flagellate, like a whip. Um, these actually move more like um, a propeller. Most bacteria that we think about have flagella on the outside of the cell, kind of like a ponytail, you know, whipping around. Um, but with these spirochetes, their flagella are actually on the interior of the cell in what we call an axial filament. So if you look at this picture, all of these little dots here, this is actually a cross-section of the cell. And you can see all these little dots are little flagella on the inside of the cell. And they come together to form this axial filament that extends all the way down the length of the cell and wraps around it. And because flagella turn like a propeller using motor proteins, when you have this motion wrapping around a corkscrew-shaped cell, you actually end up with a drilling motion. So these microbes are able to actually drill through different substrates. 
Um, so you can see it turning and changing direction. It looks like a drill bit. And here's uh, another look at this. So here it's just kind of cruising along. It might be kind of hard to tell, but it is moving just like a drill. And that's really important because that is how these enter your body. So um, it's estimated to take as few as 10 cells to infect you with syphilis. It's a highly virulent organism. It doesn't take much effort at all. And it is transmitted through sexual contact because these are actually very fragile organisms. They don't survive very long outside of the body. They're very sensitive to oxygen. And so they really have to be transmitted sexually because it's very intimate, direct contact. They don't have to spend much time outside, which is lucky because then you can't get it from surfaces. Um, and so they attach to you once they reach you and they enter the skin either through mucous membranes or through breaks in the skin. And those breaks can, or abrasions can happen during intercourse. And that results first in a local infection, and I'll show you what that can look like. <laughs> then they travel. So they actually reach the lymphatic system, make their way into general circulation in the bloodstream, and from there they can travel all over the body and wreak all sorts of havoc in different body systems. They can even cross the blood-brain barrier and affect the central nervous system, and they can cross the placenta and affect fetuses. So this is a really good um, traveler. It's able to get all over the body. So there are different phases of syphilis infection, and the first one is what we call primary syphilis. Um, this takes about 10 to 90 days to crop up after initial infection. And it's characterized by hard but painless chancres that appear at the site of infection, usually on the genitals, sometimes in the mouth or the anus. And this can last for three to six weeks, so it does resolve on its own, but it may not be noticeable due to the location. I don't know how often you look in those places, but you may not see them and you may not feel them because they're painless. Um, what I'm showing you are some representations of this. I really try to be aware of representing skin infections in different skin tones because often in textbooks um, you're only seeing these in white people, so it's really important to show different representations of what these look like in different skin tones so you can see these shankers. So at this stage, you are highly infectious. It is very easy to transmit this to sexual partners, but also to fetuses during pregnancy. And it's treatable, so it is very treatable, it's curable at this stage, which is really important to know. If it's not treated, then it can progress to the second stage, which is secondary syphilis. And this occurs about four to 10 weeks or so after infection, and it's characterized by a really persistent rash that can occur all over the body, including the palms of the hands and the soles of the feet, which is unusual for a lot of microbes that cause rashes like this. You might also start to experience swollen lymph nodes and other kind of nondescript um, signs or symptoms of infection. And at this stage, remember, these microbes have now traveled to other body systems. So when they reach the lymphatic system, for example, and they reach the lymph nodes, um, they're accumulating there and they're causing inflammation there and that's what's causing that swelling. And this rash, we still don't really quite understand how this is formed. Um, but this may not happen in everyone. So again, you might be asymptomatic at this point, but you are highly infectious at this stage between partners and to fetuses. But again, this is treatable at this stage. You can cure this infection. So then this mysterious period occurs that we call latency. And this is when you are completely asymptomatic and these microbes, just kind of seem to disappear inside of the body. And this can last for decades. Um, here's a picture of my cat, Miss Curie Stimuloid, illustrating what it looks like to be stealthy and, and to hide. Um, but even though you're asymptomatic, this can cause congenital syphilis um, during this phase. But again, it is treatable. So then I think the reason that I was so intrigued by syphilis is because of tertiary syphilis. This is what really made me fascinated by this disease and also mortified by it. 
Um, this is what we call tertiary or late syphilis. And this doesn't happen to everyone if they're untreated, but it happens to about 15% of people who are untreated, sometimes higher um, numbers. But this happens decades and decades after infection. And it's not because the bacteria are causing more damage, it's actually from the immune system having tried to reckon with this infection for decades, this chronic infection, um, damage from the immune system response is accumulating and causing this to happen. Um, there are different types of tertiary syphilis and I've listed them in the order in which they're most likely to happen. So neurosyphilis is very common um, and this is where you have damage to the nervous system and that can cause things like paralysis or dementia. Um, I think one of the tropes of syphilis is madness and that is due to this phase. Um, cardiovascular syphilis can happen because of damage often to the aorta um, from that inflammation from the immune system trying to tackle this infection for so long. And then I think the one that really sticks out to me is gummatous or granulomatous syphilis and that's what I'm showing here. Um, and this is from inflammation that damages the bone and other tissues. So this is actually the skull of a 26-year-old woman that died of syphilis in the 1800s. Um, this, by the way, is from the Mütter Museum in Philadelphia. If you ever get a chance to go, it's amazing. This is from their Hurdle Skull Collection, where they know a lot about the skulls. They know how they died, how old they were, oftentimes their occupation, and that's really helpful information to know about the person. But if you zoom in, you can see there are holes in that skull. And if you're curious, you can go to the Mütter Museum website and actually look at the skull and rotate it and play with it and, and learn more about it. So that's just what the bone looks like. But this person had to live with this for a very long time. And this is an example of what that might have looked like. Um, these are called gummas. And these are, again, because of extreme inflammation and damage to those tissues because of this immune response to syphilis. So really devastating disease, but again, treatable. So if you treat the infection, um, then you can get rid of the bacteria and allow the tissues to heal. There may be damage because of this, but you can at least tackle those bacteria at this stage. Oh, is there a question? Yeah, sorry. Yeah, so the question is, is the immune system attacking itself? So the immune system's really interesting because, for example, inflammation, you need a little bit of it. Inflammation does something called vasodilation, where it makes your blood vessels dilate so they're wider. And I like to think of it as kind of like a highway. If you have a first responder trying to get down a two-lane dirt highway, you know, it's a narrow path. You might be behind some farm equipment traveling really slowly. Vasodilation basically turns that into a super highway where you can go faster, you can weave in and out, and there are exits. And so inflammation helps immune cells get to the site of infection to try to tackle those bacteria. But if you have too much inflammation, that can cause damage to your tissues. It can also cause a lot of other things to happen. So it's about uncontrolled immune system. Yeah, absolutely. It's too much of a good thing. Yeah, so this is congenital syphilis. I think this is one of the most devastating aspects of this disease too. So this can happen um, when the bacteria cross the placenta and infect the fetus. And this can lead to a lot of problems, um, deformities in bones and teeth um, during development, um, effects on the nervous system, um, skin rashes upon birth, um, effects on the spleen and other organs. And then stillbirth or infant death. And this is a problem we still deal with today. In 2020, there were 2,000 cases of congenital syphilis in the United States and 149 deaths because of it. So this is still a very real problem in the United States. Um, babies may be born, though, without any signs or symptoms, again, but develop them later on. So again, it's very important to screen for this. In fact, um, pregnant women in the United States who are receiving prenatal care are screened for syphilis um, automatically. But it's treatable. That's another really key point. So where does syphilis come from? Um, what is its origin? Um, we don't really know, but um, here are some things we do know. 
Um, we do know that it is strictly a human pathogen and that it doesn't have any animal reservoirs out in nature. Um, rabbits get a form of syphilis that's very similar to this. It's caused by another Treponema species, um, but you can't get syphilis from rabbits, for example. Although we do use rabbits to grow the syphilis bacterium that infects humans. Um, so there's some crosstalk there. There are also some cousins of Treponema pallidum, some other subspecies that cause other diseases that are somewhat related, like yaws, which is a um, strictly tropical disease now. And we've known about syphilis since about 1495. There were writings about a really big syphilis outbreak in Europe that happened at that time. Um, this is a depiction um, from an artist around that time showing someone with syphilis. And this was a very virulent, devastating disease at the time. Um, and the name syphilis actually was coined in 1530 from a poem um, written in Italian about a shepherd named Syphilis. And he was punished with the disease for having um, betrayed the god Apollo. It also has a bunch of names, um, names after places, French pox, because during this European outbreak, everyone was blaming everyone else for its origins. And that's why we don't name diseases after places, because it's just stigmatizing and confusing. So this is a much better name, I think. Where did it originate, though? This is a big question. So there are two theories about where, especially this syphilis that caused that big outbreak originated. One is called the Columbian theory because that outbreak coincided with Christopher Columbus's return to Europe from his American expeditions. And so people thought he brought this back from the Americas, so syphilis must have originated in the Americas, in the New World. And we do find skeletal remains of pre-Columbian Native Americans who have evidence of treponemal disease. However, there are a lot of treponemal diseases that do similar things to bone, so it's unclear if this is syphilis or something else like a yaws. Um, there's the pre-Columbian theory, which says, well, syphilis was already in the old world. People have been writing about it for a long time. We just get confused because there are a lot of other diseases that look a lot like syphilis, like leprosy, um, elephantiasis. And again, we find skeletal remains in Europe from about that time that have treponemal um, bone lesions. But again, not super specific. However, there was a paper published in 2020 where they took um, bone skeletal remains from different sites around Europe, and they were actually able to extract ancient treponemal DNA from these bone fragments and analyze their DNA, and they compared them to modern strains and used that comparison to estimate how old those strains were from the bone fragments. And they coupled that with some carbon dating from the skeletal remains and some other artifacts found at the sites and estimated that those fragments were from about the early to mid 1400s, which is certainly in favor of the pre-Columbian theory. However, this window of time is not substantial enough to really nail down either theory. So there's still a big debate over where syphilis came from. But now that we have these techniques to harvest and sequence ancient DNA, I'm sure we can learn a lot more about pre-Columbian American um, DNA. I have a oh yeah, question? So my first thought was like leprosy, like mm -hmm. that was very like similar. Yeah. So They present a very similar way. Leprosy also can cause nerve damage um, and disfiguration. But back in the Middle Ages and medieval times, we didn't know about the existence of microbes. Um, we didn't really have a way to look at them or, or determine whether a microbe could cause a particular disease or not. Um, so there may have been some confusion about the written record. Yeah, that's a great question. So treatments. Um, as long as there has been syphilis, there have been treatments for it. And the entire time, it's been mercury, largely. So since the 15th century through the 20th century, mercury was the treatment for syphilis. Now mercury is toxic to bacteria, but it's also toxic to humans. So you literally had to choose your poison um, back then. 
so um, this is an example of a formulation of mercury, calomel, that was used pretty commonly up until the 20th century. This, does anybody have an idea what this might be? Looks like a syringe of some sort, but a pretty large syringe. This is a urethral syringe that was recovered from um, a pirate ship. And um, they found traces of mercury on the inside, which made them suspect this was used to introduce mercury into the urethra to treat syphilis. Yeah. Um, this is an example of not a treatment, but a patch of some sort. Um, so a lot of people with tertiary syphilis might have had gummas that caused facial disfiguration, and so people might wear an artificial nose to cover that, although we're not fooling anybody <laughs> with that shiny nose. Um, it wasn't until the early 1900s, 1910, salversan, which was the first organic treatment for syphilis, was developed. And this was pretty effective, but it's made with arsenic, which is also toxic. So we're seeing a theme. We're using treatments that are toxic to the microbe, which is what we want. However, they're toxic to the host as well. And that's a really important thing because when we're trying to treat any microbial disease, it could be viruses, it could be bacteria, whatever, we're trying to find something that is toxic to the microbe, but not us. So we have to find the microbe's Achilles heel. We have to find something that is going to affect them, but not us. And that was challenging. That hadn't been done yet. Until 1928, penicillin was discovered um, by Alexander Fleming. And he was a Scottish microbiologist. And penicillin is still the treatment for syphilis today, since the 1940s. Why is penicillin such a great drug? Well, it's selectively toxic to the bacterium and not to us. So penicillin targets a part of bacteria called a cell wall. It's made of something called peptidoglycan. Humans don't have this in our cells. So if we affect it in the bacteria, it won't harm us. Now you can have allergies to penicillin, but this is not going to target you because we don't have cell walls. Um, that's why antibiotics can't help viral infections because they also don't have cell walls, for example. But this was really important because it could treat the infection and not harm the host. And Richard Arnold was one of those people who helped establish penicillin as the accepted treatment. And he said syphilis was once a dreaded and dreadful disease involving millions of US citizens. Before the introduction of penicillin, the heavy metal cure often caused thousands of deaths each year. The morbidity and mortality of the disease itself was horrendous involving all ages from the fetus to the elderly. So this really was a wonder drug, and it, it still is. Um, this is a picture from that era of someone who has been saved by penicillin, but is still smoking. So, you know, we, we got to pick our battles, right? So does anybody know where penicillin comes from? Mold, yeah. So this is what this looks like. So. Um, Molds and other microbes, even bacteria, especially those that live in the soil, there's a lot of competition out there in nature. And everyone's trying to kind of fight for their own turf. And so microbes often make antimicrobial compounds to kill off competitors or inhibit their growth so they can take over. And this is an example of what that looks like when you're growing these microbes in a laboratory. So this is a petri dish containing artificial media. We've got bacteria on it, and here's a mold. And you can see that there's this space around the mold where the bacteria aren't able to grow. It's kind of like a moat keeping invaders away. It's a turf war happening. And this mold is producing antibiotics to ward off and stop the growth of the bacteria. This mold happens to be from the genus Penicillium, which is where penicillin comes from. Now, did anybody know that Illinois has a state microbe? We do! So, um, so penicillin was um, extracted from Penicillium um, notatum, which isn't really a great producer of the drug when you're trying to mass produce it. Um, and so we needed a way to find either a different penicillium 
um, species or optimize the production of penicillin from this mold. At the time, this was um, when this was being mass produced, World War II was happening. And so the US was called to help because we weren't being bombed. And we also had the technology to help produce this drug, extract it, and purify it from these molds. Um, but we were still looking for a mold that could produce a lot of this drug. And so um, at the USDA's Northern Regional Research Lab, which is now the National Center for Agricultural Utilization Research, it's in Peoria, Illinois, um, they were tasked with mass producing this drug from these molds. Um, there was a researcher there named Mary Hunt who found a moldy cantaloupe at a store, bought it, and discovered that the mold produced a ton of penicillin and it was much easier to mass produce from this species of penicillium. And so this species was Penicillium rubens, and that is our state microbe uh, as of 2021. So, woo, go us. So we helped mass produce penicillin. Good job. So I, I did want to mention this while we're on the topic of treatment. I think this is a really important thing to talk about. Has anybody heard of the Tuskegee syphilis experiments? OK, I see some hands. Um, but I also see some hands down, so we're going to talk about it. So um, in 1932, there was a study initiated by the US Public Health Services to examine the progression of untreated syphilis in black men. And it was called the Tuskegee Study of Untreated Syphilis in the Negro Male, which that title in itself is very packed. But the study began with 600 men, 399 of them had syphilis, 201 did not. The patients were not told that they had syphilis. They weren't told that they were being studied. They were told that they were being treated for bad blood, which at the time was kind of a generic term for disease. They were told in exchange for participating, they would get free meals, free medical exams, and burial insurance, but only if they agreed to an autopsy after their death. And this experiment had absolutely no reason to be conducted. It did not contribute to our body of knowledge whatsoever. It was just, can we look and see what happens um, in this very vulnerable population? So in 1944, remember, penicillin was accepted as the universal treatment for syphilis. Even at 1932, we had salversan, which was still toxic but effective. These people were not offered treatment, even when a cure was available. This study continued until 1972, when the AP published an article about it. This really made people upset, naturally. And a review board was assembled and they decided to stop the study, finally. But at this time, only 74 of the original subjects were still alive. Um, 28 had died of syphilis. 100 had died of complications from syphilis. 40 had infected their wives. And 19 had children that were born with congenital syphilis. And they were able to get some reparations from a class action lawsuit. But the US didn't officially apologize until the 1990s. And this is why we have a lot of guidelines now about conducting research with ethics and informed consent. You have to get consent from your participants and they have to be well informed about what they're getting into. So this is a really terrible piece of history, but I think it's important to know that this happened not that long ago. And also it explains why some people are very mistrustful of public health initiatives because that trust was broken when this study was initiated. So I wanted to mention that. So we have a lot of unanswered questions about syphilis. We don't really know how it does what it does. So one question is, how does the immune system resolve that primary syphilis? You know, you have the chancre and then it disappears. We don't know why that happens. We know that this organism has a lot of um, mystery about it, and one of those mysteries, it doesn't have very many what we call surface antigens. Antigens are things on the surface of microbes and pathogens that the immune system is able to recognize as foreign, and there just aren't many of those on the surface. And the few that there are, they can undergo something called variation, so they can kind of switch it up a little bit, 
and that can kind of trick the immune system and make it relearn its target. Uh, we don't know why secondary syphilis occurs and then resolves later. We don't have any idea. Um, we do know that at this stage, the microbes are spreading and disseminating throughout the body, but again, we don't know what's driving that resolution. Um, we know that we do make antibodies against these pathogens, but you can still find circulating microbes even when you have a high titer of these antibodies. So it seems like those antibodies aren't able to do their job as effectively for some reason. We don't really know the mechanisms of tertiary syphilis, why some people get it and others don't. And we don't understand the virulence factors that this organism uses to survive inside the human body. Virulence just means how easy it is for an organism to cause disease. And virulence factors are kind of like the superpowers that these microbes make in order to do that. And a lot of it has to do with evading the immune system or outsmarting our immune response. And we know that one of these virulence factors is adhesin um, or adhesins. These are things that microbes use to attach to their hosts. You need that in order for the microbe to infect you. If they can't stick to you, they can't infect. And these adhesins are very specific and that helps drive um, host tropism or host specificity. Why this organism can't, for example, infect kitty cats. So we don't know anything beyond that really. Um, they also lack traditional virulence factors that a lot of bacteria make. Bacteria often make things like toxins that they secrete to kind of bushwhack their way through tissue so they can invade more deeply. Um, they also make toxins like LPS that can activate inflammation intentionally so they can kind of ride the bloodstream as a superhighway. Um, but we don't find anything like that so far. And a lot of these questions still remain because this is a really hard organism to study. Um, one is we just figured out how to grow it in the lab in 2018, right? That's amazing. Um, so we were able to grow it in rabbits, in live rabbits, but we weren't able to grow it continuously over time until 2018 and partly that's because it's really picky. It's a picky eater, it's fastidious. Um, it lacks a lot of the biosynthetic and metabolic pathways that cells typically have. It doesn't have a TCA cycle, for example, if you're familiar with that. And so it relies on its host for a lot of metabolism and we still don't understand what it needs from the host. But we do know that if you supplement the growth medium with rabbit epithelial cells, some other nutrients, and the right amount of oxygen, you can get them to grow in the laboratory. We can't grow them in pure culture all by themselves, though, like a lot of other organisms. So that's a big challenge. It's also difficult to isolate. So if we study microbes, we have to be able to separate them from other microbes in a sample from a patient. And with Trypanema pallidum, you have to inject your a sample from your patient into a rabbit and then you have to wait for that rabbit to get sick and then you have to harvest microbes from that and then infect it into a rabbit again so you use rabbits to kind of purify the organism with other organisms like E. coli you can slap it on a petri dish and do that um, so we can separate them by a process called streaking <laughs> does not involve nudity but it's a dilution method so you can place a sample on an auger medium with the food and you can dilute it on that one plate by essentially moving it around the plate. Kind of like if you're um, putting peanut butter on a piece of toast and spreading it so it thins out. So we can isolate organisms that way but it's very challenging to do that with treponema and it's a slow grower. It's generation time, the time it takes to go from one cell to two cells, to, from two cells to four cells, is 30 hours. For reference, E. coli divides every 20 minutes. Much easier to grow in the lab. It's also hard to study virulence factors because we need genetic tools for that. So when we try to figure out if a gene is responsible for virulence, we break it, essentially. We make a mutation in it and see if disease is affected, if virulence is affected. And in order to do that, we need ways to move DNA in and out of that cell. 
And bacteria are cool because they can do this thing called horizontal gene transfer, where they can take DNA and move it in and out of the cell themselves. They do this a few different ways. One way is called transformation, where DNA from the environment can be taken up, usually from their dead relatives. Um, it's kind of like if you've ever played a video game where you um, kill an enemy and then you loot their corpse and you take their weapons and ammo and coins and now you're a more powerful fighter. That's kind of what these bacteria do with transformation. You can also use viruses to move DNA between bacteria. Um, there are viruses in bacteria called bacteriophage and that's what transduction involves. And then conjugations kind of like bacterial sex, they don't really have sex, but they can transfer DNA directly between cells. So there were researchers in 2021 that were finally able to do some genetics in treponema, and that's because of those growth methods that were developed in 2018. And they were able to do transformation and create a mutation. So we are now starting to get some tools to begin to understand treponema pallidum. Um, but this is what that kind of looks like. So if you have a gene that's responsible for disease, if you break it or knock it out, you look for loss of pathogenicity. And then you can also do the reverse. If you have an organism and you add that gene to it, can you make it a pathogen? Now we have those tools in treponema pallidum. But what's interesting is we can't really do transduction because so far there have been no bacteriophages discovered in this organism. Pardon the interruption, we have oh, about yes. three more minutes, please. Yeah, Thanks. so I just wanted to show you where we are with respect to syphilis today. So syphilis, you can see in 1941, really high cases, this is per 100,000. But upon the introduction of penicillin, cases really dropped. But you can see they're starting to pick back up again, and this is zooming in on 2011 to 2020. Cases are rising in the United States. You can also see over time between 2011 and 2020 where these cases are rising. Illinois is one of those states. You can see they're rising in different territories as well. Congenital syphilis is also on the rise. So you can see um, cases overall are rising. You can see most of those cases, children are born alive with no signs or symptoms. But again, those can develop later. Some are born alive with signs and symptoms, but you can see some are stillborn, and even later we have infant death. So this is a rising problem in the United States, even though this is treatable. And then who is getting congenital syphilis? You can see a lot of marginalized communities, um, Native American and Pacific Islander, um, black women, all are suffering more and more congenital syphilis over time. And this is largely because either they're not receiving prenatal care or a timely syphilis test, or even if they have a timely syphilis diagnosis, there's no prenatal care. So how do we prevent this? We can use barriers to protect ourselves during sex. Um, so you can use condoms. There are male condoms and female condoms. Dental dams are a way to protect against syphilis transmission. But most importantly, you've got to get tested and screened because you may be asymptomatic. And luckily, Parkland's Wellness Center is partnering with the Champaign Public Health Department. Um, and we're doing um, clinics on Wednesdays from 9 a.m. to 1 p.m. where you can get testing and free condoms and other resources. And if you find out you have syphilis, it's treatable. Just talk to your partner. I think we're experienced with that during COVID. If you test positive for COVID, you say, hey, friend, I tested positive. We were hanging out. You should get tested too. And that's the conversation we have to have. It's the same conversation. It shouldn't be a big deal. So I wanted to share a few takeaways. <laughs> this is a problem that is still existing. Cases are rising. But this is treatable, and you can get tested, and that's important because you may be asymptomatic. And we still have a lot to learn about this organism, but we have new tools now in our research to investigate these questions. So please don't make your V-Day a VD day. Get tested, um, <laughs> use protection, and if you're a student and you're interested in microbiology or research, you can reach out to me here. Um, you can join the science club, you can take my class, and you can ask me about the Parkland Science Scholars. 
So thank you, and I'm happy to answer any questions at this time. I see you, Claude, jump here. We might have time for a couple more. Okay, great. Um, I'm not sure if you went over this, but why are cases rising? That's a good question. It might be because people aren't getting tested and they're just not aware that they're infected. Um, there may not be access to testing. That might be a problem. Yeah. Other questions, folks? Okay, I'll come over there. Hi. Uh, first of all, are you single? No. <laughs> Dr. Stimmel. That's my uh, I wanted to ask what your favorite microbe is and why. Oh my goodness. You know I can't answer that. Well, today, I don't know. Rabies virus is really cool. Um, if you want to ask me about that later, I'm happy to tell you why I think it's cool. Any other questions, folks? All right, wonderful. Thank you so much, Dr. Lloyd. This was very fun. Thank you for coming. All right.